and then what it means for them to take and lead in a just manner based on understanding that the only place you can find justice and the only place that you can take and understand how to govern well is through that biblical reformation truths that Sam Adams clearly understood. So enjoy the uh, rerun of this program and thanks for checking back in. Welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns. The Anti-Federalist Got It Right. Thank you for joining us this evening. This is Kathy, your co-host with Tom Novolis, looking into the mirrors of history and understanding that those truths and principles are applicable to the present. We always appreciate each and every one of you who listen in across the nation. Many of you who are listening have been engaging in the battle for liberty for a number of years, and there are others of you who are relatively new to the fight for the continuation of liberty for our posterity. We are delighted that Liberty Works Radio Network invited Samuel Adams Returns to join the great list of hosts presenting on this network. We continue to ask that you would look at who the other hosts are and listen to them when you can. Additionally, please sign up and support the network. Tom, with Thanksgiving a week away, what would have been happening in the revolutionary period that could have significance for the present? Kathy, thanks for the intro. I want to do something respectful of Thanksgiving today since I believe that very few people will be interested in listening to much radio or programming other than football games next weekend. Today I'm going to give everyone some of the insights regarding Samuel Adams' core beliefs as he weaves his Puritan Biblical Reformation understanding into the essence of governance with thanks and thankfulness, always going to the sovereign God of the universe. Adams never separated one belief from the other, and he does not compromise. I simply intend to read several of Sam's articles in the newspaper of the day and excerpts from letters that he wrote to family, friends, and colleagues. I hope that you take to heart what this father of the American Revolution had as core beliefs and how he applied his biblical reformation fundamentals into every aspect of his life. In this first article, we see that Adams is able to cross time to the very present day. How so, you ask? Consider what the present administration and even the congressional leaders are doing in disrespecting the foundational religion of America. They are either changing to a false religion in the very halls of Congress and the National Cathedral to the leader of the nation, not giving honor to the traditional time of year. Listen to what Adams has to say and consider it with your eyes closed this century and not the date of the article. Article signed Candidus, Boston Gazette, November 11th, 1771. Messieurs Eddies and Gill, we read that Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, made Israel to sin. For this he stands recorded and repeatedly stigmatized in the sacred volume as a perjured traitor and a rebel against God and his country. However mysterious fawning priests and flatterers may affect to think it, kings and governors may be guilty of treason and rebellion, and they have in general in all ages and countries been more frequently guilty of it than their subjects. Nay. What has been commonly called rebellion in the people has often been nothing else but a manly and glorious struggle in opposition to the lawless power of rebellious kings and princes, who being elevated above the rest of mankind and paid by them only to be their protectors, have been taught by enthusiasts to believe they were authorized by God to enslave and butcher them. It is not uncommon for men, by their own inattention and folly, to suffer those things which an all-gracious providence designed for their good, to become the greatest evils. If we look into the present state of the world, I believe this will hold good with regard to civil government in general. And the history of the past ages will inform us that even those civil institutions which have been best calculated for the safety and happiness of the people have sooner or later degenerated into settled tyranny, which can no more be called civil government, 
and is in fact upon some accounts a state much more to be deprecated than anarchy itself. It may be said of each that it is a state of war, and it is beyond measure astonishing that free people can see the miseries of such state approaching to them with large and hasty strides, and suffer themselves to be deluded by the artful insinuations of a man in a tower and his determined bootlookers into a full persuasion that their liberties are in no danger. May we not be allowed to adopt the language of Scripture and apply it upon so important a consideration that seeing men will see and not perceive, and hearing they will not hear and not understand? Jeroboam must needs have been a very wicked governor, and he discovered so much of the malignancy of treason against his people in making them to sin against the supreme being upon whose power and protection the welfare of the nation as well as individuals so manifestly depends, and by whose goodness that people in particular were so greatly obliged that one would have thought they would, upon a retrospect of their folly in being seduced, have testified to future generations their just resentment and indignation by at least dethroning so impious a traitor. Perhaps they relented when they considered that their governor was born and educated among them. But this heightened his wickedness, as it might have convinced them that he was a destitute of the common feelings of love for one's native country as he was of religion and piety. This and many other instances of late date may serve to show that the people have no solid reason to depend upon every man that he will be a good governor, merely because of his having had his birth and education among them, as well as the folly and wickedness of priests and minions, who would from such circumstances endeavor to dupe the people into a persuasion of their security under any man's administration, the sins of which the people of Israel were prevailed upon by Jeroboam the son of Nebat to commit. Respect their religious worship on Thanksgiving Day, he had ordained a solemn festival to be kept at Bethel, in which, it seems, he had a particular view to serve a political purpose, and the people knew it although he had artfully endeavored to color it with a plausible appearance at this festival, through his influence they sacrificed unto calves. This was the dire effect of their foolish adulation of their governor. While they professed to observe a day set apart in honor of the king of kings, their thanksgiving began with a profaneness and ended in idolatry, or rather it began and ended in both. There is no question, but the priests were the visigrants of the governor, that being those exercising delegated powers on behalf of the ruler, or his heralds, to publish his impious proclamations to the people. But is it not strange that the people were so king-ridden and priest-ridden, especially in matters that which concern their religion, as to look upon the joint authority of their governor and clergy sufficient to justify them in sinning against the authority of God himself and acting in open violation of his law revealed to them from heaven with signs and miracles at Mount Sinai and registered in their book of law as well as engraved on the tablets of their hearts. It is no unusual thing for people to compliment their governors with the sacrifice of their conscience after they have surrendered to them their civil liberty, which had been the folly of that people long before, for they grew weary of their liberty in the days of Samuel the prophet, and exchanged that civil government which the wisdom of heaven had prescribed to them for an absolute despotic monarchy that they might in that regard be like the nations round about them.
Even in these enlightened times, the people in some parts of the world are so bewitched by the enchantments of priestcraft and kingcraft as to believe that though they sin against their own conscience in compliance with the instructions of the one or in obedience to the command of the other, they shall never suffer but shall be rewarded in the world to come for being so implicitly subject to the higher powers. And the experience of the world tells us that there are and always have been various ways of rewarding them for it in this world. On the contrary, if they hesitate to declare a blind belief in the most palpable absurdities in government and religion, they are sure to fall into the immediate hands of spiritual inquisitors, to be whipped and tortured into an acknowledgment of the air, or threatened with the further pains of eternal damnation if they persist in their contumacy. Thanks be to God, there is not yet so formidable a junction of the secular and ecclesiastical powers in this country. And there is reason to hope there are but few of a clergy who would desire it. Yet such is the deplorable conditions we are in. And so notorious is it to all that should any man be he who he may tell me that our civil liberties were continued or that our religious privileges were not in danger. I should detest him if in his senses as a perfidious man and in many clergymen should be in compliance with the humorous or designs of a man in power, echo such false declarations in the church of God, he would in my opinion do well seriously to consider whether an excessive complacence may not have betrayed him into the sin of Ananias and Sapphira in lying against the Holy Ghost. This is a most weighty consideration, but the times require plain dealing. We hope and believe, nay, we know that there are more than 7,000 who will never bow the knee to Baal or severely submit to tyranny, temporal or spiritual. But are we not fallen into an age when some of the clergy think it of no shame to flatter the idol and thereby to lay the people, as in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, under a temptation to commit great wickedness and sin against God? Let us beware of the poison of flattery. If a people are tainted with this folly, they will never have virtue enough to demand a restoration of their liberties in the very face of a tyrant. If the necessity of the time should call for so noble an exertion, and how soon there may be such necessity, God only knows. May he grant them fortitude as well as sound prudence in the day of trial. He who can flatter a despot or can be flattered by him without feeling a remonstrance of his own mind against it may be remarkable for the guise and appearance of sanctity, but he has very little, if any, true religion. If he habitually allows himself in it without any remorse, he is a hardened, impertinent sinner against God and his country. Whenever his profession may be, he is not fit to be trusted, and when once discovered, he will never be trusted by any but fools and children. To compliment a great man to the injury of truth and liberty may be the opinion of a very degenerate age, the part of a polite and well-bred gentleman. Wise men, however, will denominate him a traitor or a fool. But how much more aggravated must be the folly and madness of those who, instead of worshiping God in the solemn assembly, in spirit and in truth, can utter a lie to him in order to render themselves acceptable to a man who is a worm or to the son of a man who is a worm. Signed, Candidus. This subscription by Adams touches on the reality that evil leaders will lead the people astray unless the people hold true to their convictions and faith in the true and living God who is the creator of all and sustainer of every atom in the universe. The challenge for modern times is to learn and understand the historical perspective of what became common in understanding through individual Bible reading and study. 
Additionally, I say the study of writers like Rutherford with his great work Lex Rex is a must read in that Adams makes subtle references to it. Lastly, I would argue that in this day and age, the secular and ungodly governors are like Jeroboam as the agents of overshadowing true biblical Reformation religion, which many of the clergy are either duped into accepting or are the perpetrators of these idolatries and humanistic evils because they are compromised in their faith as the Bible being true. We'll pick up with what else Sam Adams had to say about thanks and thanksgiving in our next segment. Thank you for listening to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right on Liberty Works Radio Network. Welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right. Samuel Adams Returns as the subsidiary of the National Center for the Development of Constitutional Strategies, which is active in educating the citizenry with forgotten historical truths and working toward fighting that which has been destroying our foundational liberties. NCDCS is committed to finding foundational strategic methods that work for our founding fathers and are applicable for today. Thanks again to Liberty Works Radio Network for hosting this program. This is a listener-supported network, and I would encourage you to join and support the work as you can. This is Kathy Novolis co-hosting with Tom to bring you that look back in the mirrors of history and how it is relevant to the present. I'm looking forward to hearing more of what Samuel Adams wrote that absolutely resonates with this time in our nation. I'm always amazed at how the cultural, political, financial, economic, and enterprise or trade issues during the nation's foundations are virtual mirrors of the United States presently. Can we learn the first principles that Samuel Adams speaks about? What are our takeaways from the father of the American Revolution? Okay, Tom, what does Sam have for us in this segment? In this letter to his dear friend Arthur Lee, Adams talks about the way that those in government attempt to twist the truths of God's providential actions to that of supporting earthly tyranny and despotism. Adams writes something uh, very relevant to the present time with regard to the Thanksgiving message given by the governor and pushed to be presented in the various congregations. Quote, this measure was more insolent to the people or affrontive to the majesty of heaven, neither of whom, however, a modern politician regards. End quote. But what I always like to bring about is the idea of Ecclesiastes 1 9. There's nothing new under the sun. To Arthur Lee in the Samuel Adams Papers, Boston, November 13th, 1771. My dear sir, Several vessels have lately arrived from London, but I have not had the pleasure of a line from you by either of them. Since the resolve of counsel by which Junius Americanus was so severely censured, there has been a proclamation issued by the governor with their advice for a general thanksgiving which has been the practice of the country at this time of year from the very first settlement. The pious proclamation has given the greatest offense to the people in general, as it appears evidently to be calculated to serve the purpose of the British administration rather than that of religion. We were the last year called upon to thank the Almighty for the blessings of the administration of government in this providence, which many looked upon as an impious farce. Now we are demurely exhorted to render our hearty and humble thanks to the same omniscient being for the continuance of our civil and religious privileges and the enlargement of our trade. This, I imagine, was contrived to try the feelings of the people. And if the governor could dupe the clergy as he had the council, and they the people, so that the proclamation should be read as usual in our churches, we would have nothing to do but acquaint Lord Hillsborough that most certainly the people in general acquiesce in the measures of government, since they had appealed even to God himself that notwithstanding the factions and turbulence of a party, their liberties were continued and their trade enlarged. I am at loss to say whether this measure was more insolent to the people or affrontive to the majesty of heaven, neither of whom, however, a modern politician regards, if at all. 
so much as the smiles of his noble patron. But the people saw through it in the general, and openly declared that they would not hear the proclamation read. The consequence was that it was read in but two of all the churches in this town, consisting of twelve besides three Episcopalian churches. There indeed it has not been customary ever to be read of them. Of those two clergymen who read it, one of them being a stranger in the providence and having been settled but about six weeks, performed the servile task a week before the usual time when the people were not aware of it. They were, however, much disgusted at it. The minister, on the other, is a known flatterer of the governor and is the very person who formed the fulsome address of which I wrote you some time ago. He was deserted by a great number of his auditory in the midst of his reading. They walked out on him. Thus, every art is practiced and every tool employed to make it appear as if the people were easy in their chains and that this great revolution is brought about in the intimidable address of Mr. Hutchinson. There is one part of the proclamation which I think deserves notice on your side of the water and that relates to the accommodation with the Spaniards in the affairs of the Falkland Islands. This must have been referred to under terms of the preservation of the peace of Europe. From what I wrote you last, you cannot wonder if the governor carries anything he pleases in his couch here. His last maneuver has exposed him more than anything. Ne laude cum sacris translated, do you play with the sacred, is a proverb. Should he once lose the reputation which his friends have with the utmost pains been building for him among the clergy for these past thirty years, as a consummate saint, he must fall like Samson when his locks were cut off. The people are determined to keep their day of festivity, but not for all the purposes of the infamous proclamation. I beg you would omit no opportunity of writing to me and be assured that I am in a style too much out of fashion. Your friend, Sam. The idea that the government should be thanked for governance, trade, economic well-being, and life in general was not what the people believed in during the, that period of time. They clearly understood that any and all thanksgiving for all things was due only to the biblical God of history, period. So what we have seen over the last 100 plus years, because of the isms that we talked about last week, America's leaders prefer you to thank them for the pork brought back to spend on your behalf while never acknowledging that the pork is resources stolen from your neighbors, be they in the next county or over in the next state. Let's continue with another Sam Adams thought in this line of thinking. Resolution of the Continental Congress, November 1st, 1777. For as much as it is the indispensable duty of all men to adore the superintending providence of Almighty God, to acknowledge with gratitude their obligation to Him for benefits received, and to implore such further blessings as they stand in need of, and it having pleased Him in His abundant mercy not only to continue us in the innumerable bounties of His common providence, but also to smile upon us in the prosecution of a just and necessary war for the defense and establishment of our unalienable rights and liberties, particularly in that he hath been pleased in so great a measure to prosper the means used for the support of our troops and to crown our arms with most gestured success. It is therefore recommended to the legislature or executive powers of these United States to set apart Thursday the 8th day of December next for solemn thanksgiving and praise that at one time and with one voice the good people may express the grateful feelings of their hearts and consecrate themselves to the service of their divine benefactor 
and that together with their sincere acknowledgments and offerings, they may join the penitent confession of their manifold sins, whereby they had forfeited every favor, and their humble and earnest supplication that it may please God through the merits of Jesus Christ mercifully to forgive and blot them out of remembrance, that it may please him graciously to afford his blessing on the governments of these states respectively and prosper the public counsel of the whole to inspire our commanders by both land and sea and all under them with that wisdom and fortitude which may render them fit instruments under the providence of Almighty God to secure for these United States the greatest of all human blessings, independence and peace, that it may please him to prosper the trade and manufactures of the people and the labor of the husbandmen, that our land may yield its increase, to take schools and seminaries of education so necessary for the cultivating the principles of true liberty, virtue, and piety under his nurturing hand, and to prosper the means of religion for the promotion and enlightenment of the kingdom which consisteth in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And it is further recommended that servile labor and such recreation as though other times innocent may be unbecoming, the purpose of this appointment may be omitted on so solemn an occasion. Wow! Can you imagine Congress making this a national resolution at this present time? Does this not cause you to wonder what happened between then and now in regards to the personal beliefs that these founders had and the perverse lack of belief that the elected at every level of governance have in present-day America? That's correct. The travesty of the age is that many of the Christian denominations and non-denominational pastors have succumbed to the spirit of Jeroboam, as noted in the first segment of today's program. Let's see if we can uh, get another short glimpse of Adam's writings before this segment ends. The Committee of Correspondence of Boston to Thomas McGill. Boston, April 7, 1773. Sir, we, the Committee of Correspondence for the Town of Boston, acknowledge the very obliging letter to said town, signed by yourself and transmitted to us by order of the Town of Rowley. It gives us great pleasure to find that the proceedings of the town we have the honor to serve have been so acceptable to our worthy and much esteemed brethren of Rowley. This cannot fail to animate the metropolis in every laudable exertion for the common cause of liberty, the ardent zeal of your town for that all-interesting cause expressed in their letter and their judicious instructions to their representative which accompany it. Afford us a very strong assurance of the high esteem they have of our invaluable rights and their deep sense of grievances we labor under. We join with them in supplicating Almighty God for His direction, assistance, and blessing in every laudable effort that may be made for the securing of ourselves and posterity the free and full enjoyment of those precious rights and privileges for which our renowned forefathers expended so much treasure and blood. And here's another letter to Joseph Palmer, Philadelphia, April 2nd, 1776. In the last paragraph of the letter, I heartily congratulate you upon the sudden and important change of our affairs in the removal of the barbarians from the capital. We owe our grateful acknowledgment to him who is, as if he frequently styled in sacred writ, the Lord of hosts, the God of armies. We have not yet been informed with certainty that what course the enemy have steered. I hope we shall upon our guard against any future attempts. It is interesting that Sam Adams was not bashful about expressing his fundamental biblical reformation beliefs in writing his letters or the Continental Congress proclamations. 
He was not a fanatic, but a pragmatic individual that clearly understood that God transcends space, time, and history to act within the lives and within history of all that he has created. As much as Adam studied the English Constitution and ancient history, he was a student of the Bible. With this, he was able to discern that liberty had its source not in the discretion of government, but in the salvation set forth by God through the merits of Jesus Christ mercifully to forgive and blot out any remembrance of our sins. In the last segment, we heard clearly that the sinful actions of political leaders can cause a nation to sin, and with that, there is historical proof of the judgment of God. Oh, that we would hear Sam Adams' call to repentance and know that God will forgive if we individually and as a nation humble ourselves before him and then give him the thanks he is due for all things. This is really exciting to hear what the father of the American Revolution drafted in regards to God, thanksgiving, and how divine providence does act in human history. I want to thank everyone for joining us during this segment of Samuel Adams Returns, The Anti-Federalist Got It Right, hosted here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Please check out the other hosts and join the network and support the efforts of all who are fighting for liberty. Welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns, The Anti-Federalist Got It Right. This is Kathy Novolis, co-hosting with Tom to bring you that look back in the mirror of history and how it is relevant to the present. Thanks again to Liberty Works Radio Network for hosting this program. This is a listener-supported network, and I would highly encourage you to join and support the work as you can. I'm looking forward to hearing what Sam Adams wrote between 1778 to the end of his political life in respect to thanks and thanksgiving. It seems to me that he was strong in his Christian beliefs and that those beliefs extended to every aspect of his life and political statements. I also get the sense that Sam's beliefs were pretty much agreeable to the other founders since they did not go against the resolutions that he wrote and agreed that they should go out to the whole country and, when he was governor, the whole of the state of Massachusetts. Tom, where do we pick up with Sam? Thanks, Kathy, for doing a great summary of Sam and the general beliefs of not just his peers, but the citizenry in general. We are a far cry from the ubiquity of strong Christian beliefs in all aspects of Americana compared to the founding era. We must have that next great awakening, like the first great awakening, to get this nation anywhere close to the understanding and preserving liberty for our posterity. With that, let's go back to what Sam was uh, talking about and writing about, rather, regarding thanks and thanksgiving. Resolution of the Continental Congress, November 3rd, 1778. It having pleased Almighty God through the course of the present year to bestow great and manifold mercies on the people of these United States, and it being the indispensable duty of all men gratefully to acknowledge their obligation to Him for benefits received, resolved that it be and hereby is recommended to the legislative or executive authority of each of the said states to appoint Wednesday, the 30th day of December next, to be observed as a day of public thanksgiving and praise, that all the people may with united hearts on that day express a just sense of his unmerited favors, particularly in that it hath pleased him by his overruling providence to support us in a just and necessary war for the defense of our rights and liberties, by affording us unseasonable supplies for our armies, by disposing the heart of a powerful monarch to enter into alliance with us and aid our cause, by defeating the counsels and evil designs of our enemies and giving us victory over their troops, and by the continuance of that union among these states by which his blessings will be their future strength and glory. And it is further recommended 
that together with the devout thanksgiving may be joined a penitent confession of our sins and humble supplication for pardon through the merits of our Savior, so that under the smiles of heaven our public counsels may be directed, our arms by land and sea prospered, our liberty and independence secured, our schools and seminaries of learning flourish, our trade be revived, our husbandry and manufactures increased, and the hearts of all impressed with undismissable piety, with benevolence and zeal for the public good. And it is also recommended that recreation unsuitable to the purpose of such a solemnity may be on that day refrained. Isn't it interesting that here we have a resolution in Congress similar to the one given in 1777. They did not waver in belief even after another strained year of war and tensions throughout all of the emerging states. As a nation settled into a time of relative tranquility and the states were united under a new constitution, Sam Adams eventually became governor of Massachusetts. Once again, he stays consistent in his beliefs in how he communicates the necessity for thanksgiving. Proclamation, October 14th, 1795, by the governor, a proclamation for a day of public thanksgiving and praise. For as much as the occasional meeting of a people for the exercise of piety and devotion towards God, more especially of those who enjoy the light of divine revelation, has a strong tendency to impress their minds with a sense of dependence upon Him and their obligations to Him. I have thought fit according to the ancient and laudable practice of our renowned ancestors, to appoint a day of public thanksgiving to God for the great benefits which He has been pleased to bestow upon us in this year past. And I do, by advice and consent of the council, appoint Thursday, the 19th day of November next, to be observed as a day of public thanksgiving and praise throughout this commonwealth, calling upon the ministers of the gospel of all denominations with their respective congregations to assemble on that day to offer to God their unfeigned gratitude for his great goodness to the people of the United States in general and of this commonwealth in particular, more especially in that he hath in his good providence united the several states under a national compact formed by themselves, whereby they may defend themselves against external enemies and maintain peace and harmony with each other. That internal tranquility has been continued within this commonwealth, and that the voice of health is so generally heard in the habitations of the people." that the earth has yielded her increase so that the labors of our industrious husbandmen have been abundantly crowned with plenty, that our fisheries have been so far prospered, our trade notwithstanding obstruction it has met with as yet been profitable to us, the works of our hands have been established, that while other nations have been involved in war, attended with an uncommon profusion of human blood, we, in the course of divine providence, have been preserved from so grievous a calamity and have enjoyed so great a measure of the blessings of peace. I do recommend that together with our thanksgiving, humble prayer may be offered to God that we may be enabled by the subsequent obedience of our hearts and manners to testify the sincerity of our professions of gratitude in the sight of God and man, and thus be prepared for the reception of future divine blessings that God would be pleased to guide and direct the administration of the federal government and those of the several states in union, so that the whole people may continue to be safe and happy in the constitutional enjoyment of their rights, liberties, and privileges, and our governments be greatly respected at home and abroad. And while we rejoice in the blessings of heaven bestowed upon us, we would sympathize with those of our sister states who are visited with a contagious and mortal disease and fervently supplicate the Father of mercies that they may speedily be restored to a state of health and prosperity. 
that he would in his abundant mercy regard our fellow citizens and others who are groaning under abject slavery in Algiers and direct the most effectual measures for their speedy relief that he would graciously be pleased to put an end to all tyranny and usurpation that the people who are under the yoke of oppression may be made free, and that the nations who are contending for the freedom may still be secured in his almighty aid and enabled under his influence to complete wise systems of civil government founded in the equal rights of men and calculated to the establishment of their permanent security and welfare. And finally, that the peaceful and glorious reign of our divine Redeemer may be known and enjoyed throughout the whole family of mankind. And I do recommend to the people of this commonwealth to abstain from all such labor and recreation as may not be consistent with the solemnity of the said day. Given at the council chamber in Boston, the 14th day of October in the year of our Lord, 1795, and in the 20th year of the independence of the United States of America, signed Samuel Adams. Were you able to pick out any of the common threads of occurrences that were happening then and can be said to be happening at this present time? Some of these common threads in history are threatened now in comparison to when Adams gave his proclamation. Here are a number of truths and and common threads that I came up with. 1. The practice of thanking God is fit according to the ancient and laudable practice of our renowned ancestors. 2. The earth has yielded her increase. In other words, farming is successful. 3. Thankful for a that our fisheries have been so far prospered, b, our trade, notwithstanding obstructions, is met and has been profitable to us, c, the works of our hands have been established, by him that is. So then number four in Thanksgiving, war in other nations, we don't have them, five, sickness and disease in other states, six, the ongoing battle with Islamists, being the barbary pirates, being the jihadist of that period, seven, tyranny and usurpation, people under the yoke of oppression, eight, this one would never happen in modern times, recommended to the people of this commonwealth to abstain from all such labor and recreation as may not be consistent with the solemnity of the day. Now listen for similar threads in this next proclamation. Proclamation, October 6, 1796, by the governor, a proclamation for a day of public thanksgiving. Whereas it has pleased God, the Father of all mercies, to bestow upon us innumerable unmerited favors in the course of the year past, it highly becomes us duly to recollect his goodness and in a public and solemn manner to express the grateful feelings of our hearts. I have therefore thought fit, with the advice and consent of the council, to appoint Thursday, the 15th day of December next, to be observed as a day of public thanksgiving and praise to our divine benefactor throughout this commonwealth, calling upon the ministers of the gospel with their respective congregations and the whole body of the people religiously to observe the said day by celebrating the praises of all gracious beings of whose bounty we have experienced so large a share. He hath prevented epidemical diseases from spreading and afforded us a general state of health. He hath regarded our pastures and fields with an eye of the most indulgent parent and rewarded the industry of our husbandmen with a plentiful harvest. Notwithstanding the unreasonable obstructions to our trade on the seas, it has generally been prosperous and our fisheries successful. Our civil constitution of government, formed by ourselves and administered by men of our own free election, are by His grace continued to us, and we still enjoy the inestimable blessings of the gospel and right of worshiping God according to his own institutions and the honest dictates of our conscience. And together 
with our thanksgiving, earnest supplication to God is hereby recommended for the forgiveness of our sins, which have rendered us unworthy of the least of his mercies, and that by the sanctifying influence of his Spirit, our heart and manners may be corrected, and we become a reformed and happy people, that he would direct and prosper the administration of the government of the United States and of this and the other states in the Union that he would still afford his blessings on our trade, agriculture, fisheries, and all labors of our hand, that he would smile upon our universities and all seminaries of learning, that tyranny and usurpation may everywhere come to an end, that the nations who are contending for true liberty may still be succeeded by his almighty aid, that every nation and society of men may be inspired with the knowledge and feeling of their natural and just rights and enabled to form such systems of civil government as shall be fully adopted to promote and establish their social security and happiness. And finally, that in the course of God's holy providence, the great family of mankind may bow to the scepter of the Prince of Peace so that mutual friendship and harmony may universally prevail. I do recommend to the people of the commonwealth to abstain from all such labors and recreations as may not be consistent with the solemnity of this said day. Given at the Council in Boston the 6th day of October in the year of our Lord, 1796, and in the 21st year of the independence of the United States of America, Samuel Adams. Thank every one of you again for joining us this week with Samuel Adams Returns. The Anti-Federalists got it right here on Liberty Works Radio Network. 